This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. I've got a new toy in today. This is the Synology E10 M20, which is a both a 10 gigabit NIC as well as an NVMe drive card for Synology NAS devices. And so I've picked up one and then I have another one floating in here. Saberant one terabyte NVMe drive on a decent sale. One of them I already had. And we're gonna load this up into my DS2419 Plus and see if we get any improvement out of it. So it's been a while since I've made server content. I've been really busy and I really need to do a whole revamp of my rack and just have not gotten to it yet. But I have been working on some projects behind the scenes, including a full custom server, as well as tweaking my networking and revamping my Synology servers and things like that. And with that, I'm gonna see if I can try to improve my 10 gig speeds from my current main Synology NAS, which is the DS2419 Plus, with this card. Currently running the speeds, if I transfer from my fastest RAID 0 array of NVMe drives, which gets like crazy high speeds, the peak transfer speed that I see from my local drive to the NAS over my network is about 500 megabytes per second on average, usually around 350 to 450. Um, and that's full spinning disks. There's no SSDs in it currently because I didn't want to sacrifice capacity for cache. And previously, Synology did not have an option for this. It was either either 10 gigabit networking or NVMe cache. And that just did not make sense to me. Why would you need NVMe cache if you don't have 10 gigabit networking? Well, finally, while QNAP has had options, Synology has not. So now we have this here. So I want to see if I can get any improvements in my speeds, although I do have some networking issues to resolve overall and see how this goes. This will, however, involve me converting to uh, RJ45 Ethernet style networking for this, which is fine. I've got transpo transposers or whatever they're called and I've not had any issues so far with those, um, but most of my gear is rocking SFP Plus so far. I do have a dual you know, SFP Plus NIC in my NAS at the moment. So this is the card itself. It is a PCIe 8X and supposedly you could just pop it in a PC and get both NVMe and the networking. So we may try that before we fully install it in the NAS here on my test bench. But you get the card itself, has the 10 gigabit NIC on the back here and the traditional RJ45 form factor, big nice beefy heatsink for the NIC itself, and then you have the two NVMe M.2 style card slots, which do go all the way out to the 22110 size. 2280 is obviously the most common that I'm going to be using too, uh, and so you slot them in, and then you have a really nice and beefy heatsink that you stick on with some thermal pads to keep them cool because these will be stuck, you know, kind of off in the side of the case without a whole lot of airflow running to it. So you have this, and if for whatever reason, I guess if you're sticking it in a PC or your NAS uses a bigger PCIe slot, you get the bracket for that as well. In accessories here, you get thermal pads, both for the controller and specific ones for the NAND. They have specific instructions for that. I believe that one's the controller portion, if I'm remembering right. And then you get the nuts and bolts to actually attach the drives to the card. So I'm going to go ahead and install my drives, get that set up, uh, verify the pads go in the right place, and then we are going to throw it in my test bed and test bench and just see if we get networking and NVMe drives just for fun. I hate these style boxes. They are always so like tightly put together. You can't really get the slot out without just destroying the box in the process, which seems counterproductive, I guess. I don't know. They do come in these nice little steelbook cases, which seems pointless, but it's pretty cool. I've had quite a few of these uh, Sabrent drives by now. Now this does, the problem with the Sabrents here is, especially these Rocket Qs, they come with their own little uh, heat spreader here. And so you actually need to remove this if you're using it with a proper heat sink here, because this will kind of, you know, that's an extra layer that won't really conduct well between the components. And so unfortunately, this thing is coming off and it's not really gonna go back on very well. So maybe buy a drive that doesn't have the heat spreader on it already. Cause this is metal, like it's coming off as a sticker, but you can see here, we've got some super thin, but heat conducting copper of some sort. And now realistically, what are you ever gonna do with this now? So that part is unfortunate. Thankfully, most motherboards these days that you're installing drives into will have their own heat spreader of some sort for NVMe, but regardless, 
So drive one in there. We still need the port. We got to pull it out of this bad boy right here. This is one of those Dim.2 cards from one of my Asus motherboards. I actually had this in my primary workstation and just wasn't using this particular RAID and didn't want to keep sacrificing PCIe lanes to it if I wasn't using it. So we shall use it for additional projects. Yeah, this is another Sabrent drive. This is their normal rocket. So we have a rocket queue and a just basic rocket. I picked a bunch of these up on sale last year at some point. I'm gonna totally destroy this thermal pad like I did on the other side when I remove that drive. All of these NVMe systems are really not designed with like using them more than once in mind. I don't understand it. Like for people who build a computer and never touch it again, I'm sure it's fine, but come on. I'm actually not entirely certain, certain how these are supposed to go on. They don't have threads. It just sits there. But these are stuck in there. What in the world? Do you screw them in from the other side? Is that why there is actually so many screws? You do, you screw them in from the other side. That's super bizarre. I've never seen that before. Never mind, they don't really give you, I mean, they still give you one extra socket, but it's not quite as much as it seems because you're using up half the screws. So we'll have two terabytes of cache here, which is probably completely overkill. Now you may be looking at the parts list for this and stuff at, <laughs> at this exact point in the recording. I don't know for 100% certain that these drives will even work because they only list compatibility that I could find at least with Synology's own drives, primarily the 400 gigabyte form factor, which they are very expensive, especially for only being 400 gigabytes. And I was not comfortable purchasing those like that almost was a deal breaker in me buying any of this because those drives added, at least the Amazon price. I didn't see them listed anywhere else. I believe they're having stock issues on them at the moment. Um, but based on the Amazon price for the 400 gig drive, like there's, it was like 200 bucks for 400 gigs. And there was just no way there's, there can't be anything. I mean, they're enterprise class or grade or whatever. So they have a little bit more endurance, but overall, like this is fine. This will last me as long as I need it to. That is really not secure in there. I guess it doesn't need to be. There we go. That's better. But yeah, I, I really wasn't comfortable paying for like 200 bucks for a 400 gig SSD or two of them. That's a $400 investment just to get 800 gigs, which I realize again, you don't entirely need a whole lot for just cash on your Synology NAS. But regardless, I was like, eh, let's maybe not. All right, so next we've got thermal pads to attach to the chips here, which are laid out differently on each drive, of course, which is fine. One of these will cover two of the chips on the Rocket Q. I believe that's the Rocket Q. But they're a little bit more spaced out on the original Rocket. Honestly, most of these drives in a typical desktop configuration operate without that much cooling so my wager is they'll be fine regardless but don't take my word for it yeah they're covered that should be more than adequate enough Get this bad boy secured on here and voila we have ourselves a beefy boy two terabytes of NVMe cache and 10 gigabit networking. So I'm gonna attach this in my test bench. It is only running Windows at the moment because I was doing my NVIDIA benchmarking and stuff. I do not have it prepared to test anything in Linux. So I apologize for those of you who are inevitably gonna be like, well, what about the Linux test? But just wanna pop it in Windows and see what happens before we put it in the server. All right, card is in the system. Does not appear to be detecting anything, however. Like it's not showing up in network devices. I did not see a driver for it on Synology's website. Device manager. 
you know, we've just got a bunch of <laughs> PCI device listings. So I'll do a quick search, but I don't think there's any drivers for it. So I don't think it's going to really work in Windows. I'm ass assuming someone could probably hack together a driver for it, um, especially on Linux where that stuff kind of is more plug and play, but Windows driver. Yeah, I'm not seeing any drivers for it. So while theoretically it's possible, it's at least going to present as not working. Installation's fairly straightforward. We pop off this top panel here. This is how you get to the RAM, by the way. And you get access to the inside of the box. There's a little tab right inside here to loosen the PCIe bracket. And then you slide this card out. Actually, there's a Despite the fact that all the like creases and crevices are really dusty around this box, you can't really see it, but the inside of it's immaculate. There's not really any dust in it. All right, we take our new expansion card, slide it in back the way that one came out. And pull this lever back up. Now it's installed. Let's put it back together, boot it up, see how the speeds look. Dealing with storage servers and networking can be hard and pretty frustrating, and it's not always super fun for someone who doesn't specialize in it. But you want to know what else is hard work? Dealing with YouTube's algorithm as a creator. That's why I partnered with some of my creator friends to build our own platform where we don't have to worry about that stuff. And I get to put the extended editions of my videos on there. The site is called Nebula, and we've partnered with Curiosity Stream. If you liked this video, the Nebula version removes this ad entirely and replaces it with extended content. The site features YouTube's top education creators, such as Legal Eagle, Thomas Frank, and Low Spec Gamer. Curiosity Stream saw what we were doing for educational content and wanted to partner up. We've worked out a deal where if you sign up with the link below, you not only get access to Curiosity Stream and their library of thousands of educational and documentary content, but you get access to Nebula for free for the entire duration of your subscription to Curiosity Stream. For a limited time, Curiosity Stream is offering 26% off their annual plan, making it less than $15 per year for both CS and Nebula. While you're there, check out the story of information to learn about order and disorder in information studies, just like the order and disorder in this new studio I need to get back to. Head to curiositystream.com slash epos for the best deal in streaming and get access to both sites for under $15 per year. It's crazy, just do it. Once you install the card in your system under your HDD slash SSD, your drive list, you will see two different cache devices listed, assuming you had two cache drives. And then you'll go to SSD cache, create, and you can choose either a read write cache or a read only cache. I'm going to do a read write cache and then you choose your two drives. Now they do show as slightly different drive sizes, but it should be fine. It'll give you a warning that selecting different drives may affect performance, whatever. You choose which volume you wish to mount it to, choose a RAID type, one, five, or six. One seems to make the most sense for me here, given there's only two drives, so you only get one drive's worth of capacity, so I only have one terabyte of cache here, but honestly, that is fine. Gives you some warnings, blah, blah, blah. Go ahead and hit OK. And then it will build the cache. This takes a little while. Once the cache is finished and mounted, it will show you this lovely little chart saying, you know, how much you were using at any given time in terms of utilization for reading or writing, and you can begin using it as normal. Of course, it utilizes the cache kind of dynamically based on files that you access most often. Uh, I honestly, I would probably recommend based on my experience, this has been uh, like five months since I originally shot all of this. Based on my experience, I would say read-only cache is probably the way to go. Read-write cache hasn't been super useful. If you have a mainly SSD-based server in your Synology, then it probably would be a little bit different. But for just my spinning hard drive array, I haven't found the right cache to really improve things at all, honestly. Uh, however, 
Uh, the Reed Cash has actually proved beneficial and it makes me want to get another card for my other Synology NAS because this one is mainly my active projects, whereas I have another one that houses my recurring, you know, my graphics, my overlays, my intros, my lower thirds, all of those that I am referencing constantly. And I think it would help those a little bit more. But keep in mind, specifically for video production workflows, your video editing software is also caching aspects of these files locally anyway. And so uh, not every workflow will benefit the most from this kind of card, but I wanted to install it and convert my card to, or my NAS to uh, RJ45 10 gig anyway, 10 gig base T that is, uh, but it's been quite an interesting experiment. I'll probably update in a few more months if I've noticed any major issues with it or rather, you know, it actually improving my workflow should I get another one set up in the other NAS. But for the most part, just, Kind of going as normal for writes and a little bit better on reads for files that I access regularly. Hope you enjoyed. Hit the subscribe button and I'll see you next time.